right. Uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you to the organizers, uh, both of the conference and of H France for their immense work. And without further ado, I'll start my paper, Maori Rugby in 1920s France, Sports, Race, and Indigeneity. In 1924-25, the New Zealand All Blacks toured Europe, stopping in France for two weeks to play matches against the national team and a select local team. They won both of those games by more than 20 points, and in 32 contests across Europe, they celebrated 32 wins with a combined score of 838 points for and 116 against. The international press lauded them as the best team ever and called them the Invincibles. A few years later, in 1926-27, a group of Maori rugby players called the Maori All Blacks traveled to Europe to test their medal against similar competition. They too scheduled a series of matches in the hexagon, including a December 26th match against the French national team in Colombe. The French sporting establishment was more confident of their ability to beat the Maori players, even after some shocking early score lines, but to their chagrin, chagrin, the Maori run 14 out of their 15 games in France. These two tours, one following so closely after the other, offer interesting points of comparison for people interested in French reception of foreign ideas about sport, race, and indigeneity. Through a close reading of press accounts from, the Fran from France and the Antipodes, as well as documents from New Zealand Rugby Federation, my paper will explore the ways in which the French sporting establishment positioned the Antipodean teams, thinking through the French Empire's connection to the Pacific and understanding the Maori rugby players through their own preconceptions about Polynesian people. Even so, French sports journalists' views of rugby neo-zélandais changed over time, and their commentaries illustrate how the French public thought through issues of race and indigeneity in the 1920s. The French reaction to the 1926 tour in particular shows how certain ideas about sport, including styles and tactics, moved from the British colonial periphery into France. At the same time, however, as players and playing techniques moved across borders, French discourses about race and indigeneity were, surprising, were unsurprisingly, um, the, the French readers were much less, uh, were much less sensitive to discourses uh, anti-colonial or anti-settler colonial discourses embedded in those practices. Pardon me. Slide, please. The Pacific, including New Zealand, occupies a special place in the French colonial imagination. French interest in New Zealand stretched back to the early modern era when merchant captains, whalers, and military officers searched for resources and safe harbors between Asia and the Americas. In 1769, Jean-François-Marie de Surville narrowly missed being the first European to claim New Zealand following shortly after Captain Cook's first voyage, despite the fact, of course, that Polynesian people had populated the islands for 100 years. De Surville landed in several places, quickly developing a confrontational relationship with local Maori officials who had in fact saved his crew's life by delivering them necessary vegetables to combat rampant scurvy. The Surville repaid their kindness by feuding with them about fishing rights and kidnapping a local prominent leader. France's relationship with New Zealand continued into the 19th century and contributed to a broader conversation about the French Pacific. While France's, colonial, uh, co while France's colonization of New Zealand proved unsuccessful, especially after Marc Joseph Marion de Fresne's death on the South Island in 1772, France's Asia Pacific Empire emerged in other places like New Caledonia, French Polynesia, and Indochina. Uh, scholars have studied the way that France's Asian and Pacific colonies served as sites for military adventurism, economic exploitation, scientific and design experimentation, artistic and literary fetishization, and of course, as places for the incarceration of political prisoners. I, I added that because I have people working with that on my panel, but we're not standing next to each other now. Um, however, little research has been done on the influence of Pacific, or Pacific Islander people who journeyed to France, um, especially those playing sport, uh, which exposes this porousness of, of French and British Empire. One of the most sustained avenues of interaction between France and the Antipodes was, in, in fact, in the realm of sport. And since New Zealand's indigenous population was also Polynesian, uh, it remained part of this larger French Pacific imperial imagination. French colonial officials 
for quite a long time made plans for New Zealand, uh, even as late as the 1840s, when representatives of the company Polynesian dreamed of setting up a black utopia in Akaroa in the South Island. When the All Blacks and the Maori All Blacks visited France, then their coverage was refracted through this French colonial lens. France's long connections or maybe misconnections were never far from mind. In December 1926, following the last match between France and the Maori All Blacks, the French Hebdo match published a series of articles about their visit. There included a small public interest piece uh, which talked about the Maori captain Gordon Coates giving French rugby officials a small shield with a coat of arms. In exchange, the French gifted the Maori a book about French discoveries in the Pacific. This occasion provided French newspaper editors with an opportunity to discuss France's quote-unquote discovery of the South Island. The editors explained that two boats had left at the same time, completely ignorant of each other, aussi mysterious most l'un que l'autre, but with the same purpose. They went different routes, faced different challenges. The Englishman Cook beat the French to claim the island by only two hours. That's not true. And uh, the French were only unlucky because the crew could not disembark on a smooth cliff. The article finishes, and that is why Fallwasser, Barclay, Rika, and Gamel are not French. These are three are four very prominent Maori rugby players. At the same time, French sports commentators' real knowledge of New Zealand was scarce, and they frequently had little or no understanding about the place of rugby in broader imperial conversations uh, about racial, racial fitness or about the special role that Maori sportsmen have played in New Zealand's conceptions of masculinity. Kiwi rugby played a crucial role in the broader conversation about masculinity within the context of the British Empire. For example, a 1905 visit by the New Zealand uh, rugby men uh, to, to Britain, in which these Kiwi players won 34 out of 35 matches, occasioned a significant conversation in London and Manchester about the discrepant state of British masculinity. Even before 1905, however, Maori sportsmen were some of the first uh, representatives of New Zealand in Europe. In 19, uh, pardon me, in 1888, a group of Maori athletes with some Pakea supporters traveled to Australia, the United Kingdom, and Canada, playing 107 matches and winning 78. Their tour followed similar tours of indigenous Australian cricketers and First Nation Canadian lacrosse players, which helped shape uh, and, and define the symbols of these respective settler colonial nation states. For example, these 1888 natives were the first New Zealand international side to perform a haka before a match, and they were the first to wear the now infamous all black jerseys. At the same time, these indigenous tours relied upon the fundamental difference of their players from white settler colonial society to drive public interest and to generate profit for the organizers. They acted like colonial menageries. They promoted themselves with exotic imagery and they legitimized empire. Uh, slide. The French were also completely ignorant of Maori physical cultural epistemologies, and that might be said for the British and most Pakea Kiwis as well. Uh, indeed, the history of rugby and its integration, beginning with the first Maori rugbyman, Wirihana, in 1872, has been used to veil New Zealand's less than ideal history of race relations. Maori rugby began as a piece of British colonial imperialism. It taught Maori men, uh, as a way to incorporate them into colonial society and simultaneously marginalize them. By contrast, for the Maori sportsmen and organizers, the so-called natives tour contributed to a national conversation about the possibilities for Maori excellence. The tour's organizer, Joe Warwick, selected the very best men so that he could do for Maori football what Australians have done for Australian cricket and make it famous. Rather than a flat rejection of colonial narratives, Warwick's efforts illustrated novel indigenous meanings of sports, including the restoration of Maori mana or respect, uh, the articulation of Maori sovereignty, the Tino Ranga Tira Tanga, and subversive creativity. The complex relationship between British Imperial, Maori, Pekea rugby, even the indigeneity of certain players completely surprised European journalists during this first All Blacks tour. The primary motivation of the of the uh, Kiwi organizers in the New Zealand Rugby Football Union was to fund further expansion of the sport in the colonies. Uh, 
And once the team landed in England, uh, they started off their famous string of victories uh, with wins against local Devonshire clubs. The press's attention was entirely focused on these as decisive contests, but reporters back in the antipode understood it differently and took a different tack. So Australian observers quickly were keying in on the important role of the Maori. Uh, although there were only two indigenous New Zealanders with the team, the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald on, on the day after the last day of the tour uh, had a large article that said, the consequence of football having been introduced in New Zealand are uh, unquestionable. The rugby game has flourished there exceedingly, not only among people of British birth, but among the native race also. Curiously enough, the Maori took to the game con amore, and from the earliest days played it with a fine skill and sportsmanship. Many of the greatest players of rugby have been Maori. Rugby all over the world they're talking about. The All Blacks team, that is to say the, the, the team for all of New Zealand, the Maori and the Pakea, finished their tour uh, in France. And when they crossed the channel in January 1925, the French rugby establishment was already predicting a visitor's victory. Never disappointing, the Invincibles won both of their matches in a lopsided fashion. Uh, their first game against a so-called Selection Française ended with an embarrassing 30-78 scoreline. The following week, against the French national team. The visitors also showed their quality. In front of a standing room uh, crowd at the Stade de Pont Jumeau, the French fell 30 to six. French journalists accepted the loss with equanimity. The All Blacks were clearly uh, a class above, completely invincible. And Loto remarked on the beautiful spectacle offered by the visitors to showcase the precise game and finesse of their frankly unbelievable hands. And the French press made little of the fact that the two most talented players on the team were Maori. The lack of commentary was particularly surprising in the case of George Nepia, who was uh, one of Kiwi rugby's first superstars. The French press did describe him as playing with quickness and decisiveness, qualities that would later be applied explicitly to indigenous rugby players. But their allusions here seem to me a little too subtle to be easily accessible to fans who would not have been familiar with them. This is to contrast with the 1926 and 27 Maori rugby tour, which was formulated in much the same way as the original uh, 88 natives tour uh, as a means to assert Maori agency in sport. In fact, uh, one of the most uh, important figures at the time, uh, uh, an important influential Maori religious figure, Tahopotiki Warimo Ratana, the founder of the Ratana, uh, religious movement was influential in getting this started. He was arguing in New Zealand at the time that indigenous New Zealanders were underrepresented on the All Blacks and he was threatening to take over the administration of Maori football. In response, the New Zealand Rugby Football Union sponsored a special and second exhibition of rugby sportsmen in Europe, which offered new possibilities for Maori sportsmen to earn respect and promote their independent sovereignty at a time when Maori political leaders were pushing hard for the ratification of the Treaty of Watangi, which legitimized the notion of nested and separate sovereignties and Eotaroa Teoroa for New Zealand. If the racial politics of the original All Blacks tour largely escaped French observers in the Maori All Blacks visit in 1926 promoted more explicit racial commentary. Uh, the Maori team started their tour in France, and so French audiences were a little unsure. Would they be as talented as their fellow countrymen? C. E. Gonet, after watching them play, was convinced that the Maori were playing better than the French and even better than the All Blacks as a whole. And he wrote about it in Le Transjugeon. He said that the Maori tour would give French ruggers a new impulse, and he argued that brown natives rugby was a little different from the All Blacks. They're in general faster, combinations are more subtle among the indigenous, and the Maori use their force with pow their, their force and power with moderation. Gonet's understanding of Maori rugby, suffused as it was with racial overtones, also placed Maori rugby within a distinctly French conversation about the sport. For Gonet, rugby union faced a battle between the brutality of the increasingly professionalized and working class game and its original uh, amateur, uh, aristocratic, and pleasurable counterpart. In later years, this conflict would give rise to an extremely violent confrontation between players that resulted in several deaths on the field uh, and left French rugby with the name of the rugby du monde, or rugby of death. 
On the other hand, Gonet took no note of how Maori rugby players might have conceived of their strengths and weaknesses as players or their larger political mission. Needless to say, however, this Maori team was also very uh, successful on the field, quickly disabusing the French of any notion of European superiority on September 13, 1926, in their first match against Olympic Marseille, the Maori handed the French an epic 87-0 loss. They won their next eight matches, uh, losing one uh, against a, a team from Paris who bested the Maori 9-11. Uh, to 11. When they returned in December uh, for the second leg in France, they play an additional six games against top competition, including uh, Perpignan, one of the era's most successful clubs, and two uh, matches against the French national team, uh, and they win all of these as well. Many in the French sporting establishment came around to the view that they had something to learn from their indigenous visitors. Perry Soir had a rundown of uh, the commentary from other newspapers. Can we do slide? Okay, great. These other newspapers included Le Journal, Le Figaro, L'Auto, L'Eco, Le Sport, Excelsior. Almost all of these sports uh, luminaries for these journals agreed that France had much to learn. Team selection left uh, much to be desired. Coaches picked their little personal preferences without a thought for the general good. And the Maoris seemed to be playing a better kind of rugby. By contrast, the French were slow, out of shape, disorganized. Uh, especially common were commentaries on how the Maoris' adaptable style of play left French backs infinitely deceived. So in other words, the things that the French are gleaning from the games are largely technical. They're not understanding any kind of the epistemological underpinnings of the Maori All Blacks game, nor were they coming to empathize in a meaningful way with the plight of people living in settler colonial states. Only one article I could find uh, came close to getting at the Maori All Blacks mission in Europe. André Géo, one of the most esteemed and incisive interwar French sports journalists, uh, wrote about it in the Miroir des Sports with a kind of anthropological curiosity he thought about the possibilities and difficulties of the tour for the players. For months, he said, the team traveled the world like a vagabond atom. Yet everywhere they went, they behaved with courtesy and charm because they were representing a single Maori nation. For Geo, these Maori men were ultimately cosmopolitan. They spoke English, they danced the Charlton, they listened to jazz, they knew all the latest uh, show ballads. But he also noticed how behind this facade lay a deep reserve of melancholy. He described one evening in Limoges where the players uh, quit singing English show tunes and the Air Britannique was quickly replaced with the, with the popular music of their mother country. A heavy complaint arose. Sadness was at the bottom of their harmonies that grew in onerousness before ending brusquely with an exaltation of onomatopoeia. He credits these men's song with, as an expression of the sadness for their home and here Geo meant their families but it's hard not to imagine that they might have been sad for their home, their Maori country too. In spite of his more sympathetic approach and obvious closeness with the team, even Geo could not avoid lurching into a kind of racialized description of the players' bodies, black hair, almond eyes, and he was hardly alone. Uh, French commentators fell back onto racist tropes to describe the Maori's achievements, and despite their many self-evident skills, uh, some French spectators doubted that the Maori had really demonstrated any technical innovation and instead credited their naturally superior musculature for their victory. For example, the editors of Match Magazine um, wrote that the French press smiled at the very rudimentary game of the Maoris, good for the fair, like foire, yes, but rugby men, allons donc, a joke, a tall tale. The Maori um, were bumpkins. The Kiwi press in the antipodes for, for their part glosses over the subtle critiques of Maori masculinity or unsubtle critiques at times of Maori masculinity, instead uh, trying to forge a connection between France and uh, New Zealand. So they mention the following the Maori to the battlefields of World War I, uh, the Maori All Blacks dinner at the French Rugby Union, and uh, that, that there was this sporting connection now built between France and, and the Maori in France and New Zealand that would undoubtedly raise the standards of play in France. So this might be a kind of settler colonial acceptance or maybe a settler colonial blindness to racialized discourse. Um, 
nor did the French press or Kiwi press engage with any larger French critiques of British empire, uh, of which there was one when a match M editor lamented, isn't it a great pity that these superior types of muscular humanity have seen their numbers diminish since the day the Union Jack flew over their islands? This is a kind of um, notion of demographic decline, the so-called fatal uh, impact thesis uh, that by that time was already out of date as the Maori population was growing. It reads a lot more like a call to a French style humane colonization. And you guys, I guess, can't see me doing scare quotes uh, than any kind of uh, recognition of Maori sovereignty. Now, I came to know about these Maori visits and visitors because I moved to the Antipodes and scholars here have examined some of the role that these players have played in broader conversations about sports in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and I, I'm hoping that, it, that this brief um, talk, although I'm running over now, uh, illustrates a few small conclusions. First is that sports historians have been interested in the way in which sports spreads across the world, largely from the United Kingdom in the 19th century. But this study of rugby in the early 20th suggests that the imperial lines, which are usually used to explain movement of ideas and practices, do not sufficiently account for the way that sports transited across the boundaries of empire. In this case, Kiwi rugbymen bringing new techniques to France and the United Kingdom, showing how innovation was as likely to come from the periphery to the metropole, uh, and sometimes from different imperial peripheries entirely. This also is a kind of agentic process, and so I'm interested in the way in which these movements of, of, of colonial ideas reflect a kind of glocalization of rugby uh, in France as people adapt to antipodean notions of rugby in France uh, and abandon maybe some of the ways in which they think about um, rugby as only existing in the United Kingdom. At the same time, I want to emphasize that although French players borrowed some of the practices of their Kiwi counterparts and, and there only to a certain extent, they framed them always through their own French understandings of rugby. They did not apply New Zealand or Maori epistemologies to truly redefine French rugby or French society. So the notion of, of French borrowing from the antipodes as glocalization uh, probably says to us more about, about the French than it does about the Maori or New Zealanders. So although French sportsmen in the press recognized in their Antipodean counterparts new ways of playing, they did not use the occasion of these visits to challenge common notions of indigeneity, race, and empire. Thank you.